Great stories have great beginnings. The Christmas story didn't begin 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. It began at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then, out of the silence, God spoke and brought forth the wonder of light. Galaxies and planets formed. The stars and the moons and the fields and the flowers exploded into life at the sound of his voice. His favorite work, humankind, created in the image of the Creator, would hear and know the voice of God, and yet would not obey it. For thousands of generations, the voice of God would guide his wayward creation. Kingdoms and kings would rise and fall, stories detailing God's desire for his people to remain faithful, but they could not, would not. And then it was as if God went silent. There were no stories to tell. No signs of wonder. No sounds of hope. Just silence. But God loved his fractured creation and promised that one day his word would bring peace and hope for all humankind. So with each passing age, God's people waited, watched, and wavered. In spite of the silence, the story wasn't over. In fact, it was just about to get good. Very good. After 400 years of deafening silence, on a starry night, the veil of heaven ripped open and an angelic host appeared to unsuspecting shepherds. God was speaking again. God was fulfilling his promise made thousands and thousands of years ago in a town called Bethlehem. God's word was born in a manger. And it was good, very, very good. And out of the silence, God's word brought hope. God's word of peace, hope, and restoration was born that Christmas morning. The anticipated Savior had finally come.
so much for being here. Y'all have a great Christmas. It was really good. To... <laughs> oh my gosh. That's amazing. Please don't sit down. I'm just going to be here a second. Uh, joy to the world indeed and joy to your world. Uh, if this is your first time with us, uh, we're so glad that you chose to spend Christmas uh, with Buckhead Church. And um, we hope by the end of the service, you experience something or maybe more importantly, someone uh, who will shift your heart in a divine direction towards a, a heavenly father who is for you and loves you. 
what am I getting emotional about? It's Christmas. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but it is worth celebrating today, and we're glad that you chose to celebrate with us, and we're going to continue celebrating uh, through music. So if you would, say Merry Christmas to someone, and then we're going to sing together. Thanks. pray for us. God, thank you 
for this season. Thank you for what it means to all of us. Thank you that uh, you coming into the world uh, did, was, was, was an event that did cause great joy for all people. I just pray over our next few moments um, that you would expand our minds, expand our hearts as to the significance of this event, the timing of the event, the perfection of your plan, and that you would cause us all to leave in wonder, uh, being reminded that we have a God who's in control, who's leading, who's guiding, and who is, in fact, the light of the world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, um, I want to start with some words of the Apostle Paul. Um, And this is what the Apostle Paul said said in Galatians chapter 4. He said, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman. Here's my question today is, what was unique about this time? And and what does that have to do with our time in history and this time in history? What was unique and significant about that time? What was happening at that time that made it the perfect time, that made it the time in which God sent his son, born of a woman? Now, if you know me at all, you know that um, I'm going to need to create a little real estate in order for this to happen. So I can't, I, I don't have a chalkboard today. Um, but I can uh, use uh, technology today uh, just, just for a moment. And if you just humor me for a minute, um, the, the truth is, is uh, not much was happening during this time period. As a matter of fact, from the, the end of the pages of the Old Testament, the very last page until when Christ came, there's no significant uh, activity that we know of by God, at least no documented activity by God. There was a period of 400 years that, that existed between that last page and when Christ actually came. 400 years of what seemed like silence or God's absence in the world. My question is, what was he waiting for? What was God up to? I mean, that seems like a long period of time. Why so long before God showed up in the world? Now, this is why this is important. It's because some of you, you've experienced this before. Some of you, maybe you are experiencing this. You're experiencing a season of waiting. You've been waiting on God, and God has seemed silent. Maybe he seems absent. You're not where you want to be in life, or you're not where you thought you would be in life. Maybe you feel stuck, and you're wondering, how long? Why so long? Where where is God in the midst of all this? And what we're told by the Apostle Paul is that at just the right time, At the set time, when the set time had fully come, another translation says, at the fullness of time. The the Greek word is pleroma. You don't need to know that um, other than to say that this word is a a really unique word. It was a shipping term. It actually was used when when a ship was full of cargo and full of the crew. When it had come to its fullness, when it was, the fulfillment was done, when, when, when things in terms of packing had come to completion, At that time, that's when the ship set sail. That's when things begin to happen. Now, if you allow me a little latitude, can we talk biblical numerology for a second? That didn't sound very affirmative. You're like, it's Christmas Eve. You're going to make us think, but yes, I'm going to make you think. I want you to be smarter, okay? I want want you to understand. I want you to understand the significance. There's something that God's blowing up in my heart that I've discovered in this season that I just want to share with you. Biblical numerology is not some weird thing, by the way. It's just the significance of numbers and how they provide uh, insight for us into God's nature and his character and his will. Here's what I want to do. I want to start. I want to start with the number four. Can move this over here. There we go. So, so, so here's the thing. The number four in the scriptures, it derives its meaning from creation. Um, in, in creation, um, uh, specifically on the fourth day of creation, in Genesis chapter one, God completed his creation of the material universe. And on that fourth day of creation, God created the sun and he created the moon. And, and this was significant because the sun and the moon, it divided day from night. It it was what brought light into the world. And it was the primary signals of time, 
of days and of months and of years. This is, this is what we get from, from the stars and, and the sun and the moon that were all created on the fourth day. And not only that, this is an interesting thing. Um, you can share this over with somebody over lunch um, or, or brunch as it would if you're in the first service. The axial tilt of the earth is held into check by the moon. It's 23, precisely 23 and a half degrees because if it's more or less, we don't get the seasons that we have of which there are four, by the way. We have four seasons. So the sun and the moon, they provide light, they provide time, they determine our seasons. And the word seasons literally means, in the scriptures, it means appointed times. You see, this is, this is a significant idea that there were appointed times according to God's creation. There are divinely appointed times for things, which leads me to the next number. It leads me to, to 40. If 40 is also a significant number in the scriptures, it appears 158 times in the Bible. And, and it, it signifies primarily, uh, uh, and, and by the way, when you add a, a zero, it, it doesn't add nothing. You add a zero, it's a factor of 10, because four uh, with a zero next to it is 40, so it's a factor of 10. There's increased intensity with this. And so uh, 40 usually symbolized a, a season of increased intensity. But we see in these seasons, we see God's provision Throughout the, the Old Testament and the New, we see God's provision in seasons of trials and in seasons of testing. We see God's provision in the world. Some of you are familiar with some of the old stories in the scriptures, the story of the flood where God provided the ark for safety for Noah's family. His entire family was God provided for their safety in the midst of the great flood. And, and then Israel, uh, the people of Israel wandered in the, il the wilderness for 40 years and God provided for them. He guided them and he led them and he provided uh, for them. He provided water and food for them uh, in the wilderness. In Jesus's preparation, he spent 40 days in the wilderness when he was tested. And God, through his truth, provided a way for Jesus in his humanity to resist the temptation of the enemy and so four and 40, it represents God's creation and God's provision. And then when you add this third zero, we get something really unique that happens. It multiplies by a factor of 100, which 100 is significant. I don't have time for that today. We're just dealing with 400. 400 symbolized God's perfection, specifically as it relates to time. God's perfection in the world, it represented God's intentionality. It represented God's fulfillment a period of fulfillment, and ultimately, God's completion. This is, this is why this is important. Because this season, the season of darkness before Christ came, it mirrored another significant period in Israel's history. There was a period of 400 years that the people of Israel were in Egypt, and they were in slavery. And they spent these 400 years, and what's interesting about that is it didn't just, wasn't just happenstance. If you go back in Genesis chapter 15, God ahead of time tells Abraham when he chooses him, he makes his promise. He says, look, I know you don't have any kids, but I'm going to make you into a great nation. And when I do, before you, you become this great nation and before I fulfill all I want to fulfill, your people, your family, that's going to eventually bless the entire world. They're going to spend 400 years in Egypt and they're going to be enslaved but I have purpose in that season. It's fulfilling my purposes. But when it comes to completion, then I'm gonna deliver you from that. And he did. It also represents, 400 represents a period of the judges. The period of judges in the scriptures was, was a period of 400 years. From the beginning when, when, when Israel wanted a king and they got King Saul to when the kingdom finally fell and the people went into to exile it was 400 years. The number 400 is significant because it represents the divinely perfect amount of time. 400, the divinely perfect amount of time. Now, I, I, I gotta acknowledge this. I know this is hard for some of us to embrace because nobody has ever spent a divinely perfect amount of time on Georgia 400. So if you live here, if you live here in Atlanta, like we've got significant headwinds with this, but, but just listen for a second. Maybe it's a signal. I mean, this, this represented a period of waiting, 400. You've done this before. In the, in the midst of God's silence and his absence, and many of us have spent an immense amount of time waiting on 400. And at certain times of day, there is no greater example of God's absence and silence than Georgia 400. Can I get an amen on that? 
Okay. We need to amen the scriptures too, not just jokes about Georgia 400, by the way. Um, but I say that, that, and that was a bit of a stretch, but, but this was an important time. And what was happening at that time amongst humanity is significant. As a matter of fact, if we back up one verse from what the Apostle Paul said in, in Galatians chapter four, it says this about the state of humanity. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of the world, which for the Hebrew people, this would have been a callback to that period that we just talked about, the 400 years when they were in slavery. The 400 years in slavery, now 400 years of God's silence, this callback would have been a, to a similar situation when these people were in need of rescuing and they were in a dark season. And what's interesting is if you look at the story uh, early in the nation's history when they found themselves in the slavery after 400 years, after God had fulfilled his purposes, after that period had come to its completion in God's perfect time, at just the right time, God sent Moses to deliver his people out of slavery, out of brokenness, and out of darkness. See, this isn't by accident. Our God is a God of order, and he was delivering the people out of the spiritual condition of slavery and brokenness and darkness, just as he had done delivering his people out of the physical slavery and brokenness and darkness that they had been in. What's interesting is in, in, in the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, John chapter one, when John's gonna introduce us to the savior of the world, his, his gospel, his, his basically his, his biography of, of, of Christ's life, when he's gonna introduce us to Christ's life, this is what he says, in the beginning, think about this, with the backdrop of all of this, I want you to listen to these words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Nothing, not the stars, and not the moon, and not the sun, and not the earth. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know what's interesting is every major religion in the world claims to be the light of the world. Every major religion. And every major religion in the world had a set, has a set of words to live by. But this is what John tells us. He tells us that, and this is only true in Christianity, the word, in this case, wasn't a set of words to live by. The word, he became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. The word of God, personified, came to be with us. Now, here's why this is important. It's because we all experience this at different times, but you may be experiencing a season of waiting right now in which it seems like God's been silent or he's been absent. And it feels like for some of you, you may have been in a dark season or maybe we're, we're in a dark season in our period in history. And, and the reality is, is, is there's all sorts of messages communicating this to us. And, and Christmas is something unique. Christmas, John says his message, and the message of Christmas is, no, 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 the light has come. No matter how dark it seems, no matter how dark the world seems, no matter how dark your world seems, regardless of what we're in the midst of, the promise is God is with us. Now, this is important because the power of light isn't always a way out of the darkness. It's not always an immediate way out of the darkness, but it always provides a way through the darkness. It doesn't always immediately get us out of the darkness, but light provides a way in the midst of darkness. And the promise is you no longer have to wander, or wonder, or struggle alone in dark seasons. When you're in the middle of darkness, you often need a reminder. I know I've needed a reminder, and Christmas is that reminder. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. His light shines in the darkness, John told us. And the darkness has not, it cannot, and it will not overcome his light. Several years ago, Christmas 2015, uh, my wife and I found ourselves in a particularly dark season. We had just moved our family across the country and we were spending our first 
Christmas alone. We had just had family in for Thanksgiving. They all came and we had just had a child and you would think this would have been the most exciting time of the year, but my wife was dealing with some really significant, whew, just remembering the emotions of that, some significant health challenges. In fact, we thought she'd had a stroke. We took her, she woke up one morning, she had bilateral facial palsy. She was dealing with some tingling in her body. We took her to the emergency room. You know, we've got a newborn that's just literally just like days old and we're in the emergency room and they have no idea what's going on. Bilateral facial palsy is is incredibly rare. And, um, you know, they thought maybe it was some sort of unique Bell's palsy, but they didn't know what was actually going on. And, and, we had just had family, family come to town for Thanksgiving, but they left and were facing our first Christmas alone, away from family. And I'll be honest with you, I was wondering, okay, God, we, we, we followed what we thought is your plan for our life, and here we are. Where are you? Where are you in the midst of all this? And We've got a newborn and I've got three other kids running around and I have my wife's health is terrible and things are not going well at my, at my job and I'm supposed to be leading the way at Christmas and, and it was a dark season and we didn't know what was going to happen and we kept meeting with different doctors and everybody would pass us from one person to the next because they didn't know what was actually wrong with her and we finally met a doctor through a friend which gave us some sort of light and hope in this season. And he just said, look, I'm gonna take charge. I'm gonna take charge of this whole process. You guys have been running all over the place. Let me work. I have a team of doctors. I have some neurologists, some oncologists, several different specialists, and and we're gonna together, we're gonna figure this out for you guys, which felt like a, a breath of fresh air. And this is all just leading up to Christmas, by the way. And talk about not being in the Christmas spirit. This was a, this was a difficult season for us. And through a process of elimination, he figured out what was wrong. And when they figured it out and they determined what the treatment was going to be, are you ready for this? Like, you can't make this stuff up. When they determined what the treatment should be, it it was actually what they prescribed for us, even though they weren't certain the first night we went to the emergency room. The treatment they prescribed for us that night on a misdiagnosis was actually the exact treatment we needed for her to get better. And she eventually recovered. And it was a reminder for us that regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's actually happening around us, the whole time while we didn't feel it and we didn't know it, we didn't see it, we couldn't hear him, God was with us. His promises remained. He had us. He promised to guide us and he promised to provide for us. And he did. God placed, he positioned that doctor to reflect his light in a dark season, which is also something, by the way, that that we're told in the scriptures. In fact, Jesus said this, when he came, he said, you know, he came and he was the light of the world. John said, he's the light of the world. And then Jesus comes on the scene. And as he's calling his followers, he knows at some point he's going to be leaving. And he, he says this, he says this to them. He said, no, no, you're the light of the world now. And you should let your light shine before others that they could see your good deeds and they could glorify your father in heaven. And that's exactly what this doctor was for us. And and the truth is, is for some of you, this is how God has positioned you in the world. There's this old analogy, just one last thing. And this is, this is, this blows my mind. This is something that, that I, I, you, you, there's some things that you just look at and you go, there's, there's, that can't be coincidence. Like it's, it's not possible that there's, there's that much congruency in the universe. You've maybe heard this old analogy of the moon. The reality is, is the moon is positioned to the earth in a, in a very specific way. And, and, and it's also related to the sun and positioned uh, in the sun in a, in a significant way. And on that day of creation, when God put the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky, he positioned the sun such and the moon such to the earth that there could be light that was created for the world light in in the midst of daytime and light and darkness and he, he positioned them perfectly and and the, the analogy is that the, the moon puts off no light it, it, it actually in and of itself it, it produces no light it's only lights up the night sky because of the sun and, and you may have heard this analogy before that that Jesus as the source of light when we reflect his light Because John, remember, said that in him was light and his life was the light of all mankind. And he's saying to you as his followers, he's saying to those of you who've chosen to follow him, I want you, I've positioned you to reflect my light in the world. 
And sometimes his life illuminates the way for us, but sometimes he chooses us to illuminate the way for other people. It's the way God works, especially in the midst of darkness. This is what God does. And like the moon, positioned perfectly to reflect light in the dark sky, maybe God's positioned you this Christmas season to provide light for somebody in the midst of darkness, maybe somebody in your family, maybe somebody in your office, maybe somebody in your neighborhood. At times, God positions others to remind us that he's near. But sometimes God positions us as a reminders, reminder to other people that not only is he near, but he cares and he'll provide for us. And, and maybe, maybe this will blow your mind, I don't know, but God's uh, perfection and God's provision uh, is reflected amazingly in God's creation. Are you ready for this? This, is, this just blows my mind of how orderly God is. Did you know that the sun is 400 times the size of the moon? I mean, you're not getting this. The sun <laughs> is 400 times the size of the moon. And do you know it's 400 times further away from the earth than the moon is? That's why they look the same, the same way in the sky. This is not connecting with some of you. This is what should be happening right now in your head. Most of you are not connecting. This should be happening all around the room. And actually, this should be happening all across the interwebs. I mean, this is absolutely phenomenal what God has done. Look at both the sun and the moon are perfectly positioned to provide exactly what life on earth needs. Perfectly. That's, that's what God, he only knows how to do things perfectly. Look, it takes more faith to believe that this is coincidence than it does to embrace it as yet another signal to you and to me that the, to the whole world that God is near and he is the light of life. And he has come to be your light and your life, which leads me to the original single signal. Are you ready for this? The very first signal that God was coming near. One of the most famous parts of the Christmas story, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. This was signaling something, but they didn't know what. And the angel said to them, he said, don't be afraid. I bring good news that'll cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, the town that represented the kingdom that, that God said would last forever, in that town, the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The waiting is over. There's no longer a need to wonder and to wander. The long awaited Messiah, the light of the world, the Savior has come. And He came to bring good news of great joy for all people. For people who are in the midst of good seasons, the people who are in the midst of really difficult seasons. At, la at last, the light is breaking through. It's shining in the midst of darkness. And that's what Christmas is all about. It's what Christmas has always been about since the very first Christmas is God deciding to step into the world at just the right time, sending his son born of a woman to be the light of the world. I just wanna finish with this. If you're in a dark season, maybe darkness has come over you and it's come over your life and God seems silent or maybe he seems absent in your life. It seems like you've been dealing with darkness in a season of trials and testing. This is the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is that a savior has come and he's come to light up your world. And the truth is, is regardless of how dark the night, regardless of how dark your circumstances, there's light that's come into the world. 
and eventually his light will lead us out of darkness. But personally, the promise is, regardless of what you're in the midst of, God pr pr promises to personally lead you through those dark seasons. For some of you, that's exactly what happened over this last year. You stepped into the light. You put your faith in Christ for the first time and you let your light shine. Some of you got baptized up here for the first time or in one of our student uh, environments or our children's environments and you displayed the light of the world and you've embraced the idea that Jesus came to not only light up your life and give you life at one time, but to, to guide you through life in the midst of darkness, in the midst of dark circumstances. And, and some of you this year, it was a coming back to the light and so here's what I wanna do is to represent that. If this was your year, and just a minute after I pray, I wanna invite you to come and down front, there'll be some candles lit down here. And I want you to help us light up this whole room. If this was your year that you came to faith in Jesus for the first time, or you went public with your faith, or you're, you're coming back to your faith in Christ, I, I want you to be the ones as carriers of the light, symbolic of what we're all to be to come and come down front or there'll be some stations in the balcony where you can light a candle. And then I want you to help us spread light to fill this entire room. But first, if this Christmas, you've never made the decision to invite Jesus to be the light of your life, to open your eyes and awaken you to new life, there is no better time than Christmas to receive the gift, the greatest gift ever given the gift of light, the gift of hope in the midst of darkness. In him was life and his life offered to us became the light of all mankind. Would you pray with me? If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, maybe this is your moment. It simply happened by you just saying, God, today I, I recognize something that I've missed all along, that I, I've been wandering in the darkness. I didn't even realize it, but I've been wandering in darkness. And today I embrace the fact that you've signaled in an extraordinary way the coming of the Messiah, the coming of my Savior, not just the Savior of the whole world, but a Savior for me, a Savior that would give me new life, that would open my eyes and guide me with his light in the midst of darkness to ultimately the life, the fullness of life, the everlasting life that you promised each one of us. And today I receive that gift of his life to be the light of my world. Thank you for this amazing gift on Christmas. And God, I thank you for this gift for all of us. May Christmas this year serve as a reminder that you're near, regardless of what we're in the midst of. Your light is near and it guides us in the midst of darkness. If we'll look to you, if we'll follow you, if we'll pay attention, you're near. And you're signaling your nearness in extraordinary ways in the world. Open our eyes to see it. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. If this was your moment or if this was your year, would you come light a candle down front and carry it back and help us light up this entire room to represent the light of the world has come. Let's do that now.
I can see the light breaking through And even in the shadowed times You don't ever run and hide I can see the light breaking through I can see the light breaking through Speak life, give peace in the unknown, and hold me when I'm barely hanging on. I believe, I believe that hope will dawn. Oh
I get all of you to hold your candles up high in the sky? Look at that. It represents the light of the world. It's come into the world. May you shine his light bright, not just this Christmas season, but all through the new year. God has perfectly positioned you to be his light. Let's shine his light in this Christmas season and all in the new year. Would you blow out your candles? We're gonna finish with uh, one more song, but I just wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. Um, got really dark in here all of a sudden. Um, so I can't see you, but I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. And uh, we're gonna finish with a song uh, that our music director says is the greatest song of all time. Not just the greatest Christmas song, but musically, right? The greatest song of all time, that's what Drew says. So uh, sing this song with us uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Merry Christmas.
monster was born I think that would be my favorite song if I could sing like Sharita. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was second. I came in second in the competition, but uh, that was amazing. I love you. Uh, hey, thanks so much for being here today. We wish you a very Merry Christmas. Students, if you're a middle school student or a high school student, step across the hall to the studio, see some of your leaders and have some uh, hot chocolate. As a reminder, we will be online only next week online only next week for a very special message. We'll be back in the building on January 7th. We'll see you then. Bring your friends. Have a very Merry Christmas.